Let the Bible Speak, with your speaker, Brett Hickey. By Genesis 13, Abram and his nephew Lot had become wealthy. So successful were they, in fact, that they ran out of room. Conflict broke out among Abram and Lot's herdsmen. Ever gracious, supremely unselfish, Abram offered a solution in Genesis 13, 8. He said, Please, let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Abram, the older man, deserved dibs on the land of his choice, but generously offered Lot the first choice. Oh, that we could always be so considerate to our spouse, our brethren, and our fellow man. Lot could have thanked Uncle Abram, but insisted that Abram take the land that Abram preferred. But no, immature Lot could think only of himself and his own interests. Thankfully, the New Testament reminds us to follow Abram's example and Jesus' supreme example in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This morning, we want to explore the context behind Jesus' words in Luke 17, 32. Remember Lot's wife. But first, enjoy our song. Gently Jesus speaks to his children, love each other as I have shown. Then when life with its strife is all over, come and meet. Our man Lot had poor impulse control. He had low self-awareness. We read in Genesis 13, beginning with verse 10, Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord. Verse 11, then Lot chose for himself, and notice there's no indication that Lot is married yet. He chose all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. 
but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Someone has said that the hardest thing to learn in life is which bridges to cross and which ones to burn. Another expressed a similar truth. Many live their lives like the high-rise workman who was carelessly walking on an upper beam one day and fell off. As he was falling, a man on the 21st floor cried out, How are you doing? The man responded, So far, so good. This spirit can certainly be seen in Lot's life. His decision-making skills were defective. Lot couldn't connect the dots between cause and effect. Lot rubbed elbows with the only man called the friend of God. He had an opportunity to learn from him and to grow, but began making a series of choices that cascade until Lot and his family find themselves in the throes of a major crisis. Abram and Canaan, Lot and Sodom. Good for Abram, not for Lot. In Genesis 14, Lot lost all he had in a war involving the king of Sodom and was taken hostage. Abram, his uncle, comes to the rescue, attacking Lot's captors with over 300 men, freeing Lot and restoring his property to him. It was only a matter of time, however, before Lot was in hot water again. Lot was repulsed by the wickedness around him, 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, but he had put down roots. He married, apparently, a Sodomite and started a family in Sodom. As we'll see, God would have to send angels to finally drag him out. In Genesis 18, verse 20 through 22, we find that sin in Sodom had become so extreme and so widespread that, like in Noah's day, God couldn't take it anymore. God determined that they must be destroyed. They must be eradicated. When God shared his plan with Abraham, Abraham pleaded with God not to destroy the righteous with the wicked. What if, Abraham asked, there are 50 righteous souls in the city. Will you spare the city? God agreed. Abraham sensed, though, that that was too easy and resumed his negotiation. What about 45? God said, if I find there 45 righteous souls, I will not destroy it. What about 40? 30? 20? God agreed at each amount. Abraham began to sweat it. Dare he ask one more time? But he does in verse 32. Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. Well, you know the verdict. There were not ten righteous souls in all of Sodom. The die was cast. Sodom and Gomorrah's days were numbered. But what was to become of Lot and his family? He was a righteous man after all. In, Se in Genesis 19, God prepares a way to escape judgment for Lot and his family. Two angels in human form enter Sodom. Lot, sitting at the gate of the city, aware of the potential peril awaiting strangers, prevails on them to stay at his home. After supper, shortly before bedtime, a crowd of men surround Lot's house. What was happening? The Bible says, Genesis 19:5. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. The New King James adds that we may know them carnally. This wasn't a social call. This wasn't about coffee and donuts. They didn't just want to get better acquainted. These were evil men with wicked intentions. We need to clarify something here. Those within the homosexual community who claim to be Christians insist that the sin of Sodom was merely a lack of hospitality. Now, I agree that the behavior here was inhospitable, no doubt about it, but now it was more than just that. The Apostle Paul, beginning in Romans 1.18, speaks of the wrath of God being visited upon the wicked. In verses 26 and 27, the Holy Spirit tastefully describes the sin historically associated with Sodom. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men 
committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Lest there be any confusion, God told his people in Leviticus 18, 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. A sin is a sin, is a sin. Any sin is bad and dishonors God. But now God records in scriptures a series of abominations and homosexuality is one of them. An abomination was something filthy, something nasty in God's eyes, something that gave off a foul odor, something that disgusted God, something that God hated. This is what we read God says about homosexuality. God hates all sin, and we're all sinners, but some sin is especially abhorrent. God further demonstrates his strong aversion to this sin in Leviticus 20, 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Men today suggest that those who voice opposition to this lifestyle are guilty of the same evil as the racists. Far from it. Men are born white, Hispanic, Asian, and so on. But men choose to live the homosexual lifestyle. Exodus International's 230 local offices in the United States and Canada support those who have abandoned homosexuality. Two independent research teams, Bell, Weinberg, and Hammersmith, in 1981, and Cameron and his associates in 1985, both report that 2% of the heterosexual population said they had once been exclusively homosexual. Both these studies, according to uh, Nell and Briar Whitehead's book, My Genes Made Me Do It, also put the incidence of homosexuality in the general public at 4%. This study and others demonstrate that young homosexual men went straight as they became older. Your genetic makeup and your home environment can make you more susceptible to this temptation, but the individual still has the right, the ability to choose. Let's go back to our study, our story in Genesis 19.6. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. We learn in 2 Peter 2, verse 8, that Lot's righteous soul was vexed and tormented by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. I don't doubt it. But you know what? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, that evil companions corrupt good morals. And he'd been surrounded by evil. Lot sheltered these angels. But what was he thinking to offer these animals his virgin daughters? What kind of a compromise was that? His judgment had become clouded. One more point before we get back to our text. We have yet to read a word about Lot's wife. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, and this is the story about her. They have eaten supper at this stage, and it's almost bedtime. We can assume that she's there, and his self-respecting mother would have come untrained with this kind of plan for her daughters that her husband discussed. But instead, we find an eerie silence. You know, it's long been said that women set the moral tone for the culture. If that's the case, women and not just men failed Sodom and Gomorrah. Back to Genesis 19:9, And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men, angels who appeared as men, reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and then shut the door. And then they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Once safe inside, the angels urged Lot, listen, you got to get out of here. 
round up all your family, and run for your life. God has sent us to destroy this wicked city. Lot's um, sons, when he relayed the message to them about God's plan, they just laughed at him. So Lot had at least four daughters, two married, two single. He would have to leave the two married daughters behind. The next morning, the angels urged Lot to take his wife and his two daughters and get out of town before it's too late. Lot was slow to catch on. Genesis 19, 16 says that they lingered. They hesitated. They stalled. So the angels grabbed them by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, the text says, and dragged them out of the city. Why did God have such a hard time getting across to Lot the urgency in getting out of town? Was it that Lot was losing everything he had accumulated over the years? Was that what was so hard for him? Was he struggling to take in the enormity of what was going to happen to the city, to friends and neighbors? Perhaps. Was he desperately trying to persuade his married daughters and their husbands to come with him? That's likely. But it's also possible, based on what happens next, that Lot was trying to keep his wife, a native of Sodom, on the same page with him. Her faith was not as strong. No one outside of their family, apparently, even attempted to live for God. There weren't ten righteous souls in town. Whatever the holdup, were it not for the patience of God exhibited by his messengers, neither Lot nor his family would have escaped Sodom. Genesis 19, 17. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Escape. Escape. Get out. Get out of town. God was long-suffering. But his message was clear. Don't look back. Instead of responding obediently, Lot said, No, I can't go to the mountains. Lest something happens and I die. Listen to what he's saying. Lot was still just thinking about himself. I can't lest I die. He pleaded that God would allow him to go to Zoar. And God, amazingly, once more graciously allows it. Then verse 24 through 26 says, The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the city cities and what grew on the ground but his wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt as if that wasn't tragic enough lot's daughters then conspire to get lot drunk and commit incest with their father as a result lot's daughters give birth to moab and ammon his sons and grandsons their descendants became the Moabites and the Ammonites, thorns in the sight of God's people until they're destroyed much later by Nebuchadnezzar. Let's go back, though, to our focal character, Lot's wife and her bizarre demise. God clearly said, don't look back. When Lot's wife disobeyed and looked back, she became a pillar of salt. So when Jesus says in Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife? What did he want us to take away from this story? One truth that we can glean is that God views disobedience as a serious offense, even if it does not involve some violent crime. While certain sins are given abomination status, as we've noticed, uh, Jesus tells Pilate, for example, that the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. We still see with Lot's wife that any sin, any disobedience, can grieve God. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, the Holy Spirit tells us that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, the Bible says, Therefore we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, 
How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God tells us here and illustrates with Lot's wife that number one, we must pay attention to what we have heard. We must listen carefully. Number two, that we not drift away from what we've heard. And number three, since every disobedience under the old law received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great salvation as offered through Jesus Christ? Let's not disregard any of God's commands. No matter how small and insignificant they may seem to us from a human standpoint. Perhaps Lot's wife thought, what harm could one look do? I mean, is that really something so bad? Why did she look back? She had to leave her home and all the possessions she had acquired. Her eye was not single. She had divided loyalty. She couldn't make up her mind. Her heart was in the wicked city instead of on the mercy of God and His provision for her salvation. We can certainly learn from that. When we become a Christian, we are in the world. But John 17, verse 12 and 16 says that we are not to be of the world. We too must turn our back on sin and the world when we respond to the gospel. The apostle charged in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This danger of loving the world, crowding out God and His Word is certainly pictured by the backward glance of Lot's wife. We must keep our eye on the prize, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus gave Judas, according to Luke 9, 1 and 2, power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, to preach the kingdom of God and to hear the sick. Yet he took his eyes off Christ and looked back to the world. Christians are warned of their names being blotted out of the book of life in Revelation 22, 19. In Revelation 20, 15, we're told that anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We have security in Christ. No one can pluck us out of His hand, but we may choose to turn away from Christ and wander out to the far country. Some of the most pitiful words in Scripture describe this very condition in 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they were already out of town, Lot and his wife and two daughters. If they escape and are again entangled in them and overcome, they look back. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Don't look back. The greatest defense Lot's wife could have made for looking back was that she was leaving her married daughters and perhaps grandchildren behind. She likely had siblings and maybe even living parents she was leaving behind. Maybe she was concerned about their welfare. Very likely, but this would not have justified her disobedience. We all have friends and loved ones who have rejected the church and the new life in Christ. Many of us have loved ones who have died outside of Christ. There's no deeper pain, but we have to remember we must love Jesus. We must love Him more than all of our family or else we are not worthy of Him. Stay tuned and we'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message. There is a land to which I'm going on Not far from knowing what it's like to be at home But I must cross the ocean wide for on the other side is heaven Land just for the foe. The harbor lights, harbor lights shining, shining bright before me, guiding me, guiding me to the door of silly waves. That bright shore, that bright shore, he there will welcome me into the land of the never-ending day. Waves will blow me, I will have no fear. For Jesus said, Jesus, come and dwell. Come the raging sea. Ship will soon 
Let me give you something to think about. Even if you were not to make it to heaven, isn't it true that you would not want to see any family or friends not make it and join you in that place? Again, in Matthew 10, verse 37, the Bible says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Don't look back. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray that you have heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like a copy of this sermon, Remember Lot's Wife, please write the address on your screen and we'll be glad to get it out to you. You may also request a free Bible study course that you can complete at home. We're also offering a free CD while supplies last on how to be saved and who is this man about Jesus please visit our website, letthebiblespeak.com, and watch videos of the program at your convenience. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.